Well, my name is Anton Lenik, and uh, I, I'm originally from Ukraine, but again, to make a long story short, um, I started to study Ukraine uh, on a professional ma in, in a professional manner relatively recently, and actually that's my first book on this subject matter, because previously I was mostly focused on uh, other areas of uh, studies, uh, and this book is my first uh, product or my first work focused exclusively or mainly on Ukraine. So the starting point again was uh, what happened in Ukraine in 2013-2014 because it looked uh, non-similar to what we observed previously in Ukraine and in other countries. It means large-scale bottom-up mobilization with very few input from above and that what uh, was particularly appealing to me because one of the uh, authors who also wrote about uh, the revolution of dignity Andrew Wilson, at some point he even compared uh, the events of 2013-2014 with old-fashioned European revolution that, uh, for example, happened in France in the, in the 1917, 1918th century. And indeed that was my feeling as well. It means we observe something that we didn't observe for a long time. And it was very interesting to make sense uh, what is going on and how to, how to understand. Uh, that's very large and very, uh, how to say, very, uh, mobilization that is not guided from a ball. That was particularly interesting for me, that aspect. Essentially, this aspect, from my point of view, is still underexplored. Because normally, when we talk about the re revolution of dignity, we talk about, uh, we, we, talk, we talk about the issues in geopolitics, how it had an, has an impact on international affairs on the international uh, orientation of Ukraine or reorientation from Russia to the European Union. But there is, as uh, there is an aspect that is even more interesting from my point of view. It means how these events impacted the life of uh, everyday life of society and uh, that uh, rebirth of Ukrainian nation, uh, let, let's put it in, in that way, because that's even more important than European or Russian orientation or geopolitical orientation in general. In addition to what you said, it means the quality of experts or expert opinion on, on Ukraine. Well, the problem is deeper because so-called Ukrainian studies compared with Russian studies, they are underfunded and they are not um, that developed uh, as uh, other branches of post-Soviet studies. And that's exactly one of the points I'm trying to develop in, in the book. I'm trying to argue that uh, well, we overlooked, we have overlooked for a long time Ukrainian studies, and as a result, uh, we don't understand what is going on in that country, uh, as a result of that uh, long-term neglect of Ukrainian studies. Uh, the other uh, reason for me, uh, back to your question, is that um, Initially, Ukraine was not that different and probably from, for example, Russian society. And that neglect probably had some uh, rationale behind it. But uh, when Ukraine starts to be different, and that's what we observe now, it means Ukraine start to, ch to change that path. And that's exactly what we need to study, how to make sense of that very profound change and not a change that doesn't stay at the level of geopolitical orientation, but it's much deeper. It means, first of all, it's social changes or uh, what we observed, uh, the, that rebirth of volunteer movement. Volunteer movement in Ukraine has absolutely no parallel in the post-Soviet societies. And again, there is no explanation why it happened and how to preserve that, because it's something very precious. Uh, that they were able to uh, to give birth to uh, that strong and that mass uh, ma uh, that mass volunteer movement, and uh, again to help them, we need to study that, because uh, uh, you know, again one of the aspects that I'm trying to address in, in the book is that Ukraine itself is not very interested in itself. Let's let's put in, in in that it means the intellectual the intellectual life or intellectual efforts to understand what is going on are insufficient even within Ukraine. Because there is some kind of expectation that answers are known in the West or answers will be given at some point. What happened to us or what we need to do next? But that's not true. Exactly because there are so few parallels with what we observed in Ukraine and what we are still observing in Ukraine. So that's why it's uh, uh, 
also efforts from inside or from, from, from within that, uh, that we need to promote, also intellectual efforts. Well, lesson of history is important exactly because uh, when we talk about the Ukrainian nation state, it uh, has been mostly uh, at the level of a project. It means what is to be built, but that a project that has not been achieved yet. So that's why it's important to see why it wasn't achieved and why the history of Ukraine as a nation state is so short in historical terms, because the message of that chapter is exactly to show that uh, uh, the history of Ukraine as a nation state is very short, and um, f f for most of its history, Ukraine was a part of various empires, or it was uh, included in some other geopolitical entities, Russian Empire or uh, Lithuanian uh, Polish Commonwealth and so forth, but as a separate entity, Ukraine didn't exist for a very long period of time. And uh, uh, the, the, the rationale or the reason for uh, investing that heavily, what I mean by investing that heavily, I'm not a professional historian, and for me it was just to start it from scratch, it means to read all that body of literature. For example, I needed to read all nine volumes or Groshevsky, which is rare, because not all these volumes are even translated into English. Only a few volumes are translated into English. I'm not speaking about short versions of his history. I'm talking about nine volumes, and it took for me at least four or five months well, to carefully study all these nine volumes. And I'm not pretending or I'm not positioning myself uh, as a historian, but it was necessary, and I'm, I'm glad that I did that, because now I, I understand much better. Well, that's a starting point. Because again, that starting point is not that far in, in the past, as in many countries, like in France or in Germany, when they had their nation state birth back in the 18th century or in the 17th century. In Ukraine, it's now, when we have that moment. And without that historical context, it was impossible to, again, to, to, to make sense of it. Well, that was uh, really spectacular, I mean, that reading, and it was not a torture at all. It, it was a pleasure, really intellectual pleasure, because his arguments are engaging, and you understand uh, much better even your own experience uh, when you spend time in Ukraine. Only when uh, when you spend, uh, or when you read his observation about his life in Lviv, for example, because uh, he spent uh, a significant part of his life in Lviv, and he, he made a number of very relevant observations, and the same is about Kiev and some other parts of Ukraine. But my interest is inside of the society and uh, well, to, to, to see how society is developing or uh, emerging from, uh, from, from nowhere is exactly, uh, it's impossible without reading Ruszewski because it's a part of national identity. And uh, I even cite that expression, uh, historians, they were front runners in the process of uh, national identity building. Because without knowing history, you cannot build your national identity. And again, uh, that's what we're observing now. The process of building national identity in Ukraine. How we can understand that national identity without Groshevsky, I really can, <laughs> cannot understand. Well, the general finding, uh, it can be done, uh, I can just uh, essentially repeat the title, because that's really the message. Usually the focus is on um, external aspects of uh, current processes in Ukraine. My focus, or what I propose to, uh, to study more in depth, is what is going on inside and what are internal sources of growth in Ukraine. Not how we can help from outside Ukraine, but how Ukraine can help itself or how people from Ukraine can help themselves. That's the key question. It means they can help, and they demonstrated that very persuasively in 2015, 2014, because essentially they defended themselves, and uh, they also were able to stop that process, uh, to stop that aggression, but that, that was done within, from within. And exactly why we cannot also see what can be done from within now when uh, they need also to, 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 to initiate large-scale economic reforms or large-scale administrative reforms. Also, focus has to be done not on foreign teaching, not to give them new blueprints or new textbooks saying, well, okay, that's all written here, you just need to follow that. 
it won't work because it hasn't worked. Uh, it it hasn't worked yet, and it it won't work from my point of view. Ukraine is not a not a good people. Uh, some people argue, well, we, we we attempted to show them what is the right sequence of. Uh, of reforms, but they have never done that. And indeed, I mean, when they are approached in that uh, way, it means uh, seen from outside or taught from outside, there are very little chances that uh, uh, there is a prog uh, there, is, there is significant progress. This progress or this development has to be propelled from inside, and that's the, the message of the book. I'm trying to identify some points that are particularly promising in this regard, and the most promising is the volunteer movement, because exactly that's the only source, only that's probably an exaggeration, but that's the major source of hope when we talk about uh, today's Ukraine. If Ukraine is able to completely, uh, to, to finally build a nation state and to transform into a democratic nation state, it can be done only with the help of that uh, volunteer movement, not with the help of uh, teaching, not with the help of grants, not with the help of uh, some external input. It can be done on the basis of volunteer movement. But the problem is that the volunteer movement now has passed uh, its peak, it means the, its high point. And it's very important, again, to see what can be done, at least to help them to, 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 to stay at that level. And uh, to, to help uh, to, to help him, them to, to, to continue to operate. Because again, it may just disappear as unexpectedly as they appeared in 2014. Yes, that's accurate. That's accurate, but what they're uh, missing or what is um, not existing yet, it's exactly that uh, support or connection between the volunteer movement and intellectuals in Ukraine. Because that intellectual input is very important. That intellectual input was very strong in the case of Poland, in the case of Solidarność. Because Solidarność, they uh, were able to transform themselves into an actor, really an actor of uh, radical and historical changes, only, only because they were well connected not only with uh, grassroots movement, but also with intellectuals. But in the Ukrainian case, intellectuals are not very active in that volunteer movement. And here is uh, your question. It means what skills they are maybe missing or what, uh, what skill they don't have yet. And indeed, they have skills, well, to, for example, how to help the military, how to organize logistics at that level. But perhaps they don't have enough skills at the, at the, um, at the, uh, at the level of building a state or at, at, at the level of... Uh, administrative reform. It means how it can how it can be done. But again, it cannot be learned from textbooks, from my point. It can be learned only in cooperation with, on one hand, with nation, national intellectuals, Ukrainian intellectuals, and on the other hand, with some foreign experts, but not as mentors, but just as someone uh, as uh, who is willing to help them to make sense of their own experience, giving a uh, very rich experience of the West where you're well connected, there is a risk of corruption. It means well, if you're too well connected in a particular country, uh, there is a risk of corruption. One of their strengths is exactly they are not well connected. But at the same time, that uh, lack of connections, local connections, it means that they don't, uh, they are not connected to, to that uh, actor that is born in Ukraine. It means the volunteer movement. Because the volunteer movement was not, uh, I'm not a specialist on Georgia, but what I read about Georgia, they didn't have a strong volunteer movement. Reforms were, uh, were carried out in top-down manner. For example, you uh, mentioned the reform of the police in, in Georgia as one of the, uh, their successes. And indeed, it was uh, one of their successes, they were first to uh, disconnect uh, the road police from the idea of corruption, because the road police is almost everywhere in the post-Soviet countries, is associated with, with corruption. It's enough to look at Russia, it's enough to look at Ukraine and so forth. Indeed, road police equals corruption. Georgians were able to dissociate that, but they uh, they have done that in a bottom uh, in top-down manner. It means by some administrative pressure. By some, uh, but in Ukraine, uh, conditions are different. It means uh, there is something that is growing from be uh, from below, the, the the volunteer movement, and uh, exactly that volunteer movement not only can be, not only can be used, but also shall be used.
to ver vernacularize. It means to make them adapted to the local institutional and cultural conditions. And that's the challenge in uh, reforming Ukraine. Because Ukraine is so big that it cannot be reformed in top-down manner. Because conditions are different and they are diversified even within Ukraine. There are differences between the West, the Center, the East and the South. And these differences are still existing. So we cannot ignore these differences. And the best way to take them into consideration is exactly to use the potential of the volunteer movement because the volunteer movement is strong almost everywhere. It's not concentrated only in the West. Many people expected that the volunteer movement would would be strong only in the West because they have they have a history of volunteer movement. Like self-help movement in the past and so forth. But now volunteer movement is even stronger in central Ukraine than in the West. And that's again, uh, that's, that's again something that we need to explain, that, uh, something that we need to make sense of. Well, I, I was uh, surprised by, uh, by a few things indeed. One of the things, uh, and I uh, put it forward before, was uh, a rather low profile kept by Ukrainian intellectuals in all that process. It means uh, instead of trying to get connected to the uh, volunteer movement, or at least to uh, well to, to, to be associated with uh, with that movement from my point of view it's still disconnected and that's a major omission because without connection between the volunteer movement and intellectuals there is no uh, th there are not many chances of, for success back to your question it means what kind of skills they are mi missing what what kind of uh, skills they don't have these skills potentially uh, are in the hands of intellectuals but these skills have to be, how to say, uh, only in the case when there is a connection between uh, intellectuals and uh, that uh, bottom-up movement, when uh, it can succeed. So that's the first uh, unexpected. Because really, I, I still cannot make sense why Ukrainian intellectuals are so uh, oriented toward uh, external factors or external health. Uh, given that in Ukraine there is a, a so powerful actor such as uh, volunteer movement, why they don't work with vo volunteer movement? Why they don't uh, engage with volunteer movement? So that was the first unexpected um, result. And the second unexpected uh, outcome uh, related to the first one is that uh, essentially um, there is no public debate in Ukraine, properly speaking. It means, well, obviously there are some space for exchanging ideas, or uh, internet is one of them. Uh, but uh, if we compare with Poland in the 80s or in the 90s, there is no strongly developed space for public debates for uh, discussing matters that are important for Ukraine now. Let me give you just one example. You probably heard about uh, the draft law uh, by Ukrainian. Uh, by Ukrainian, it means is their attempt to protect the national market and uh, to make national producers more competitive, at least how they frame that draft law. But again, uh, that approach has both, uh, both strengths and weaknesses. It means it's it, 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 it's it, it's very tricky thing because it can easily become a source of corruption, as everyone knows. It means when we uh, when we go that uh, when, when when we go down that road. And the point is that there is not uh, not much discussion of all pros and cons of that uh, draft law because, from my point of view, it's something necessary. It's something that Ukrainian uh, Ukraine uh, Ukraine need. And in in the chapter of my book, I uh, not necessarily I propose something like that, but certainly I consider options that are close to that idea of uh, the draft law by Uk uh, by Ukrainians. But at the same time, again, without discussion, without discussion of what can prevent from making this a success. It won't be a success. It will be a, an additional source of corruption. It means we, uh, they need, it, it, it's not even our duty to discuss that law. It's first of all the, uh, the, the duty of Ukrainian economists to discuss it, to discuss what are drawbacks, what are advantages and disadvantages of that uh, proposal. But there is not much discussion. There is just a criticism of that law from the uh, from the part of the liberal economists, and uh, not much. At least I didn't see much arguments, uh, more or less coherent, in favor of that law. 
So, and again, uh, that's the second uh, major emission from my point of view. It means what is needed in Ukraine is uh, the culture of public debates. Pu uh, the culture of public debates that can be uh, appealing uh, to people uh, with no special background. It means to ordinary Ukrainian. Well, also Ukrainian Pravda, it's a uh, very popular uh, internet resource, as you know, and they publish also commentaries regular, on a regular basis. But um, the point is that if you consider the readership, <laughs> I even uh, made a small comparison because I publish commentaries in uh, some Russian mass media and in some Ukrainian mass media. And I can compare, for example, what is the uh, average readership? When you publish a commentary in top level, um, like Ukrainian Pravda or Vedomosti in Russia. And uh, again, in Ukraine, all these commentaries, uh, they're not, uh, they not broadly read. It means, well, it's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 3, readers. And yes, and it means it's the question of reaching the audience. That's what I mean by a way weak uh, culture of debate, because it, it has to be created. Nothing not emerges just from nowhere. It, that culture of op-ed commentaries, of promoting that culture of dis public discussion has to be has to be worked on. Let, let's put it in that, in that way. Obviously, I agree with you. There is Hromatsky radio and t uh, t television. The, 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 there is Ukrainian Pravda. There is uh, a number of other publications. And uh, currently, Ukraine has much more vivid uh, space of mass media than Russia. That's without any question. But at the same time, despite of that advantage, it means that space is not over-regulated in contrast to Russia. But in spite of that advantage, Again, there is not much demand for reading that. <laughs> there is not, uh, well, they don't reach out the audience. That, that's the point. They are told, or at least in their mind, uh, the, the, there is that um, binary thinking. I, I, can, uh, I can label it as binary thinking. It means in the past we were dependent on Russia. Now, thank God, that's gone. <laughs> we are not dependent anymore on Russia. But at the same time, they are willing to think that, um, well, they can depend or they can rely and they can just hope that the West will solve all problems. Again, to, uh, to, to promote an alternative view, it, 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 well, it has, uh, well, efforts need, are needed. Efforts are needed. It means uh, to, to find a midpoint between dependence on Russia and dependence on, well, on the West. It, 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 it cannot be just uh, a result of uh, spontaneous pro process. And, and again, input of intellectuals are needed. But intellectuals, they are too, from my point of view, they are too, I wouldn't say naive, because probably that word is not appropriate, but uh, they don't see um, that third alternative that Ukraine can and shall be built from within. It's very interesting, and from my point of view, it's one of the subjects that has to be studied soon, because it's one of the missing points or one of the missing elements in a potential success story of Ukraine. I mean, uh, that connection between uh, intellectuals and grassroots movement. But I have an explanation, at least tentative explanation. Uh, in the past, uh, all bright Ukrainians, uh, where they were studying, well, certainly not in Kiev. They were going to Moscow. Because in Moscow, while well, universities were better and uh, they were offered good conditions and so forth. Now, a bright Ukrainians, what they're doing, they're going to study in the West. And again, uh, that creates that mindset that we are oriented either in that way or in the other way. I can even judge my, by myself because I was born in Ukraine. And I finished secondary school in Ukraine. But then I went to, to Moscow because Moscow State University was, at that time, was considered as much better option than Kyiv uh, National University. And now I see, even by publications, uh, Ukrainians that are, um, that, that, that are showing great promise, they are oriented towards studying in the West, which is fine, which is necessary. But again, the point is that uh, without uh, national tradition of intellectual debates, 
and into the way you live it intellectual life it's very impossible to change uh, that double thinking or uh, binary not double thinking but binary thinking it's it's a better word binary thinking dependency either on them or on them but not on ourselves because they can depend on ourselves and uh, uh, let me make a very short coming back uh, comment uh, back to your question about uh, lessons of history one of my preferable ukrainian movies is uh, probably uh, you also watched that movie is based on one of the early novels by Hogel, Gogol on lost uh, diploma or lost kramata it means a document that was lost when a Cossack was sent to to, 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 to St. Petersburg to deliver that document and what the message of that movie is the message of that movie is let's not think about uh, for whom we need to work let's work on ourselves let's learn how we can work on ourselves and again that message is still unheard that's uh, that's uh, that's my feeling to learn how we can uh, how we can rely on ourselves and how we can work on ourselves uh, to keep a long story short uh, i would uh, completely agree with your take on um, on the opposition movement in russia it means it's very much managed it means it's it's not spontaneous it's not uh, bottom up it's top down in the past it was mostly dependent on foreign aid it means foreign grants so it was dependent on foreign sponsors then they uh, as you probably know they cut that connection it means it's very difficult these days to get any money from <laughs> from foreign sponsors in russia when you are a civil activist so what they are doing now they are making them dependent on the government because the government gives them money but obviously when the government gives them money well they cannot protest too much as you said it's uh, very much controlled pressure you cannot go too far in your position <laughs> So uh, to put uh, to put it simple, in Russia, uh, that's uh, the civil society that is managed in top-down manner. Bottom, uh, it, it's not bottom up. In Ukraine, what happened in 2013, 2014? For the first time, it was an explosion from from below, and that indeed what makes Ukraine currently different from Russia, because previously it was similar. Unfortunately, it was too, too, too way too similar among Russian intellectuals and I also keep uh, in, uh, an eye on what's going on in, Ru in Russia uh, they consider uh, uh, what's going on in, in Ukraine uh, with, with, with a kind of sympathy but for them especially for liber uh, Russian liberals the reason is not because Ukraine was able uh, finally to do something in a bottom-up manner for them, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the pattern or what uh, the model of Ukraine is attractive for uh, for the other reason, because they see uh, that Ukraine has a chance to implement liberal blueprints or uh, to to well to, to, to move to, to make a radical move toward Europe or to to, to some Western models of uh, liberalism. So that's. Uh, that's the explanation of their sympathy and they're still consider Ukraine with sympathy because for them Ukraine uh, has better chances to implement liberal models but again for uh, for me there is a better difference between Russia and Ukraine and this better difference is exactly that grassroots movement grassroots initiatives and that's something that is not quite appreciated or even not quite understood in Russia that it's so huge, it's so uh, so active, and it's uh, at some point, and it's even in my book, I calculated uh, the uh, contribution of uh, volunteers in Ukraine to uh, GDP, and compared with, with uh, contribution of volunteers in Canada, you, you you would be surprised, but because Canada is considered as a front runner, it means Canada is considered as having one of the strongest uh, civil societies or volunteer movements. And in Canada, it's about 0.5% of G GDP that uh, people contribute to volunteer initiatives. But in Ukraine, it's almost that figure. And it's done without any tax breaks. Because in Canada, everyone knows that people who contribute, it's tax exemptive, and uh, they, they get some benefits from that. In Ukraine, nothing like that exists. People uh, run significant risks when they collect uh, money from, uh, from sponsors, from uh, ordinary people. And in spite of that, Ukraine was able almost to repeat that uh, best pattern of Canada. 
And again, uh, that aspect, it means that explosion of bottom-up initiatives is not quite appreciated, is not quite understood in Russia. If Russians consider Ukraine with sympathy, that's because they believe that Ukraine can move better or closer to, uh, to the ideal of liberalism. But there is a deeper difference or better difference from, from, from my point of view. And that better difference is exactly uh, ability of, uh, of Ukrainian society to produce the, vo the true volunteer movement. Uh, the major conclusion is that uh, in spite of all these events uh, and in spite of all promise that these, these events showed, it's still not clear cut what would be uh, the situation in Ukraine in, one, in, in a few years from now, because it can go anyway. And unfortunately, there is no guarantee that the volunteer movement can maintain the same level of activism, the same level of public support as it was maintaining uh, recently. So that's why it's crucial. Uh, now it's really a crucial moment, because if uh, uh, it's gone, it means if that volunteerism is gone, it would be very difficult to repeat the same level of mobilization in the future. Because people will think that, okay, we did it but we didn't achieve anything serious, or at least we, we produce the same, the same kind of problems, we run in the same kind of problems as before. So why to do it again? So that's why now it's a really a crucial moment whether uh, that bottom-up mobilization can survive and can, uh, can preserve itself as major driver, a driver in a social economic development, or it will be just again a return to the previous path, with dependence on uh, foreign aid or foreign advice and so forth. And as uh, it, it will be a road essentially to nowhere from my point of view, because again, um, if they have not learned before, why, uh, why to expect that they would learn now these lessons? Well, we often consider Cossacktum as an example of a kind of democracy. Well, and indeed, they have uh, they, they had many elements of democracy in their internal organization because everything was uh, elected. Uh, while uh, uh, the heads, uh, starshina, were able to to be ousted if they were not performing well and so forth, but all that was exactly in uh, at the level of spontaneous protests. It means well, okay, uh, we are not satisfied with our heads with our leaders, then let's just riot, let's make another riot, and they will be gone. But uh, what Ukrainians have to learn is how to do on everyday basis, how to control the government on everyday basis, how to participate in the government affairs on everyday basis. Because uh, it cannot be based on Maidan mechanism all the time. I mean, uh, the, the way the government is controlled. Maidan is very powerful tool to control the government, but it cannot be everyday tool to control the government. That's what I'm trying to say. The current uh, moment in Ukraine is as important as uh, what they lived through in 2013-2014. Because uh, in 2014-2015 it was the question of uh, life and death for, for Ukraine as an independent country. But it's still the question of life and death, because if uh, the volunteer movement is not able to sustain, is not able to learn how to control the government on an everyday ba basis, unfortunately it would be a return to the previous pattern. And then again it, it, it would mean that uh, all these sacrifices that Ukraine made recently, they were uh, not necessarily well warranted. And that's, uh, that, would, uh, that would be very sad, because again, the chance that Ukraine uh, get currently, or still has currently, it's very precious. It means to build a, sa a safe, sustainable, democratic nation state, not dependent on foreign forces. It doesn't mean that Ukraine doesn't need to make alliances, or make unions with the European Union, with the United States, with Canada, and so forth. It's all not excluded. But first, Ukraine has to learn how to be self-sustainable, how to, uh, to rely on, on its own forces, how to rely on its own resources, economic, democratic, uh, cultural, and even uh, intellectual, especially intellectual, because that's one of the problems from my point of view, inability to rely on its, their own intellectual resources.
Well, you know, one of my uh, sources for inspiration, not direct inspiration, uh, because he, uh, this person has never wrote about Ukraine or even about Russia, uh, but uh, I'm talking about Hernando de Soto. Have you heard about uh, this? Uh, th th does it ring a bell for you? So this is a, a South uh, American uh, Peruvian economist and political scientist and a civil leader as well. And his message is that all these advisors uh, they are useful only to the extent that they help people to learn their own experience. It means uh, they show them how strong they are when they rely on themselves in all senses, in economic sense, in uh, social sense, in political sense, and so forth. And again, it's not about giving any lessons or uh, not giving any remedies. Uh, to uh, to anyone is just to suggest that you need to look for these remedies on your own and what can help is uh, the way you learn about your own strengths where to look for your strengths in other words and from my point of view uh, the, 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 the beauty of Ukraine today is the volunteer movement and that's where we need to look for inspiration and when uh, that's where they need to look for solutions look what they have done and let's learn from them. Not uh, not le uh, not learn from uh, textbooks, but let's learn how they did it. Thank you for having me, uh, William, and uh, thank you for having this discussion. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Th thank you, sir.